Good morning. Good morning, Roots Tech. As Shipley said, I love stories. In the spring of every year, Jackie and I, uh, when we were in service as governor, had what we deemed to be one of our favorite events. We would invite everyone in the entire state of Utah who had turned 100 years of age or older to come to the governor's residence where we would celebrate their lives. Every year, something memorable happened. One year, there was a man who was 102. His wife was a mere 99. They had been married for 77 years. That is exactly the way I responded. I said, 77 years is a long time. And he responded in a voice about like this, it is a long time. <laughs> but we're going to get a divorce. I said, you're going to get a divorce after 77 years? Why now? Wanted to wait until the kids were dead. <laughs> That's that, that is a line I want to use on my own someday. <laughs> Just after I was elected, our only daughter, Anne Marie, uh, was, I think, about 10 years old. And I was tiptoeing out, out of the house one day very early, late for a meeting. And she said, I have to talk to you. I said, I'm in a bit of a hurry. What is it? She said, I need to know. If you get married, does it mean you're going to have a baby? I said, that isn't what that means. She said, so do, how does that happen then? <laughs> now, you've all been in this situation. And I said to her, Anne-Marie, I, I want to talk with you about this, but I want mom to be there when we do. She said, you don't know, do you? Well, today I'd like to talk just a bit about family stories and stories in general. I'd like to talk about the way I tricked myself into writing a personal history that has had great meaning to me and I believe my family. I like to tell stories, and once I began to think, the stories I've been telling in some of my speeches and when I interact, they seem like I've used them for too long. I think I'll see if I can come up with some new ones. And one Sunday afternoon, I took out a pad of paper, and I thought, I'm just going to see if I can fill a page full of ideas. And it took about 10 minutes as I started writing down things I had remembered. I thought that was fairly easy. I wonder if I could do 100. And I just started writing down one or two or three words that would remind me of some event in my life. Not profound things, but just things that I had remembered. And I got 100 within a relatively short time. I thought, I wonder if I could do 1,000. And I started a little project called A Thousand Stories, and I just didn't write the story, I just wrote a line, and I found myself amused by it, and I went home to Cedar City where I grew up and drove down the street, and everywhere I looked there was a little story I could write, and before I knew it I had a thousand stories, or at least a thousand storylines, and I put it aside, and a couple of months later I got it out again and thought, I think I'll just group these into buckets and see if I can't at least put them into categories. And then I put it aside for a while, and then I began to, I saw a, a history that my great-great-great-grandmother had written that was eight pages long, handwritten. It was so meaningful to me. And I concluded, I need to get those thousand stories out and at least write a little bit. It doesn't have to be pretty. And before I knew it, I had written, uh, and I enjoyed it, and it turned out to be a couple of volumes of personal history. And not long ago, my daughter told me one of the most rewarding things. She said, our eight-year-old says that a Saba story, they call me Saba, is their favorite nighttime bedtime story. A meaningful thing to me, and I tricked myself into it. Well, I've begun to write a bit on my public service, and I've used the same technique. I have written a whole series of stories down, and so Shipley said it might be a good idea to have you help me tell a bit about which, decide which ones I tell. So you're going to see on the screen, I think, a list of topics. There we go. 
And I want you to get your cell phone out, hold it up, and you'll see up on the top a keyword. Go to the area of texting, and in the place where it says to, put 91011. And then read through that list of things, whether it's the governor's mansion fire, a little bit about the Oval Office, winning the Romney ne uh, nomination, uh, Olene Walker and the day I talked to her about becoming governor, uh, or life as a cabinet member, working at the White House, when George Bush decided, or at least when I thought he was deciding to run for president, the day Utah won the Olympic bid. Let's just see what you'd like to hear about. Well, let's start down at the bottom. The, the day Utah won the Olympic bid, and you can keep voting. There'll be a lot of people in this audience who will remember this. You will remember that we had worked as a state to seek the Winter Olympic Games. The day that the bid was to be decided, we were in, in, uh, in Budapest. The Olympic Committee was to vote. We put all of our effort into describing what a good job we would do, etc. The Olympic Committee went out to vote, and we were in an auditorium about the size of this, and there were four bid cities who had all put the same amount of effort as we had. Many of you will remember that at the city and county building here in Salt Lake City, 130,000 people had gathered. We were awaiting the, the outcome. In four other, three other cities, the same thing was occurring. We all waited in the audience with a lot of tension, and suddenly the door opened on the side of an auditorium about like this one, and one at a time, the members of the International Olympic Committee came out onto the stage. And finally, the last person out was Juan Antonio Samaranch, the chairman of the International Olympic Committee. It was one of those moments when everyone's heart beat together at the same time for the same reason. That happens so rarely. If you were at work, you were hovered around a television or a radio. If you were on the road, you pulled over to hear what was happening. Let me just remind you what happened. We have a video. Okay, click the little arrow on the bottom. <laughs> there you go. The National Olympic Committee has decided to award the organization of the 19th Olympic Winter Games in 2002 to the city of Salt Lake City. That was a great memory for me. Okay, back to the list. Let's see what else there is. All right, let's go up to the governor's mansion fire. Many of you will remember this. We love the governor's mansion. Um, it was such a wonderful place for our family to reside. Our, little, uh, our youngest child, at the time we were elected, I think was about three years old. And one day I called home and I, we had a conversation about like this. He answered the telephone. Hello? I said, Weston, is that you? It's me. Can I talk to mom? She's busy. What about Anne Marie? It's his sister. She's busy too. What are they so busy doing? Looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> It was a great place for our family to be. We, I might add that we were the first family to actually occupy the governor's residence for a long time, and we sort of changed the culture there, I might add. So December the 15th, 
of that year, I was preparing to go to the legislature and present my budget address, just going over the last details, and my security came in and said, Governor, there's been a small fire on the second floor at the governor's residence, but I think we have it all out. Well, it seemed to me that's probably some place I ought to be checking, and so I jumped in the car and drove to the governor's residence, and as I turned the corner, I could tell that it was not a small fire, and it was not completely out. In fact, I saw flames coming out of the top of the governor's residence. My thought would have been exactly what yours was, to immediately look to see if my family was okay. And I found Jackie and little Weston and her the members of her, some colleagues of hers in the parking lot, snow coming down, watching the flames. There were, it was a dramatic moment in our lives. Uh, as I'm happy to say that everyone was safe. Jackie tells the story of having been working in, our, in the residential area with the family. She heard a crackling outside, the, outside of the, uh, her room and she went out and saw flames shooting up from a Christmas tree that had been placed in the center of the atrium and improperly wired and a spark could have set the flame off. Uh, it was Christmas time and if you ask my children about the most memorable Christmas that we ever had, it was being together after we had lost essentially everything we had. Uh, people were so kind. That day, we, that, that week, we went to the homeless shelter and helped there, giving a special meaning to us. We were taken care of, but others weren't. And it was a profound moment. Gratefully, over the next couple of years, the residence was restored into a wonderful place. We were able to use it in so many ways to entertain guests and to show the best of the state. One of the memories I have of after it was repaired was uh, the Dalai Lama was going to come to Salt Lake City. And we invited him to stay at the governor's residence. And uh, when the Dalai Lama comes, there's quite a bit of fuss. And some people came very uh, early to say, now there's some things that you do and you don't do with the Dalai Lama. For example, never touch the Dalai Lama and you should always refer to him as your holiness. And by the time he came, I was just ready to stand at attention. I didn't know exactly what else I, could, I should do, but he arrived, and uh, the first thing he did was put his arms around me and give me a big hug and say everything. I, it's so nice to be here, etc. And we were walking up the stairs to go in and show him to his room, and there were three Tibetan children who were there. And they had been placed for a ceremony outside the governor's residence. The first was holding a little bowl of rice. And he, he tossed it in the air, and so I did the same thing. And we went to the next one, and there was some salt. And he ground it in his fingers, and I did the same thing. And then we put our little finger in some milk and flipped it into the air. And I did the same thing. So we took him inside, got him settled, and sat down for a moment. And I said, Your Holiness... Would you teach me the meaning of that ritual that we performed on the way in to the, to the residence? And he said, in Tibet, we've been doing that for thousands of years. And to be honest, I have no idea why. <laughs> at, the, at the end of that week, I was teaching a young adult Sunday school class of 18 to 25 year olds at the time. And it turned out the Dalai Lama had to leave in a time that would be coincident to my class. And so I just invited them all to the governor's residence and said, oh, we get a chance to meet the Dalai Lama. So I sat them down in a, in a uh, nice place and uh, they waited. He came out, came in and sat down and just had this most pleasant conversation and taught them. And I want you to know, I think I must be one of the only people on the earth who can say the Dalai Lama substituted for Sunday school teaching for me. <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, winning the Romney nomination. I have a feeling that it's not the Romney nomination that some of you are interested in. It may be what's going on today. And so I could just draw a couple of conclusions. Uh, many, you may not be aware, but I spent a lot of time in 2012 trying to help Governor Romney become president. And one of my jobs in that process was to be the delegate counter. 
Because if you're going to be the nominee of the party, of, uh, uh, in the Republican Party, you have to get 1,237 delegates in order to be successful. Now, a circumstance existed then that exists really in much greater proportion today. And that is when you are running for president or to become the nominee of your party, you really have to eliminate the others in one of two ways. One, you have to, in essence, they have to be suffocated financially or in terms of their ability to get attention to the point that they no longer become relevant and they drop out. Or you just have to get 1,237 delegates by winning all of those states. It became evident in 2012 that this was a different kind of year than we had had in the past, and that is happening even more so now, because the primary system has two or three characteristics this year that's different than we've had in the past. One is that the, the primary elections are consolidated into a shorter period. And the second is that the delegates are allocated proportionately in 60% of the states. That is to say that every candidate can get delegates. So the reality is if you begin to look at how a person must do in order to get a majority of the delegates, 1,237, they have to win almost 45% of the popular vote on average in every state. So as you watch the nomination unfold, watch to see not just who's winning, but watch to see if they actually get at least 45% of the popular vote. And if they do, they're on track, but if they don't, and if the rest of the field gets at least 55%, then we may be moving toward a time when none of the candidates will get the 1,237 delegates. And we faced that in, in, uh, in 2012, but I'll just leave that as a little tidbit for you to watch as the uh, primary season unfolds. So let's talk a bit about uh, my good friend, Olene Walker. Many of you from Utah will know Olene Walker, She's a wonderful woman who was my lieutenant governor for, uh, for the 11 years almost that we worked together. Uh, I received a call from President Bush to ask if I would serve as a member of his cabinet. Uh, President Bush uh, asked that I not tell anyone until the last possible minute, and one of my favorite memories of, of serving as governor was after a cabinet meeting, asking Olene if she could stay after, that I had something I needed to speak with her about. No one knew but my wife and I and one other person. I said to her, Olene, I'd like you to know what a profound experience it has been to serve with you, but I have a piece of news for you, and it is that very soon you will become the first woman governor in the history of the state of Utah because I've been asked to leave and serve in Washington. Olene just drew a deep breath and said, I'll be ready. And indeed, I knew she would be. Uh, Olene Walker served with distinction. We lost Olene a couple of months ago uh, after a, a lengthy illness. But it's a woman that I have, uh, have deep appreciation for. Well, let's uh, look at what else is there. Let's talk a little bit about the Oval Office. The Oval Office is the people's office. President Bush used to say, they call this the Oval Office because there are no corners to hide in. Um, this tells you a little bit, of, uh, it'll tell you a little bit about President Bush. And the first time, I, not the first time, but a memorable time is that when I, he asked me to be head of the Environmental Protection Agency, I said, Mr. President, that's a really difficult job. And I said, let me just say that uh, when I was in high school, I think I was the best catcher in the league um, but I really preferred shortstop because when you were playing catcher, you got a lot of foul tips and you had to wear chest protectors and shin guards and a mask, and there was a reason for that. He said, well, and I said, that's a little bit like the EPA, but if you need me to do that, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do it. And I said, when I was a, in high school, uh, I played catcher 
until I was a junior in high school. And then my senior year, they finally let me play shortstop. But every now and again, I'd have to strap on the catcher's gear and catch. And if that's what you need me to do, I'll do it. But I want you to know I'd rather play shortstop. He said, good, you play catcher for a while. And then I had a great experience in making friends and learning things at the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, a couple of years later, he won re-election. And one Sunday afternoon, I was at home. The phone rang. It was George W. Bush. Mr. Secretary, could you take a call from the president? Yes. Mikey, he said. That's what he called me. He said, I'm going to make a change or two in the cabinet. I'd like to know if you'd like to go over and be Secretary of Health. I said, yes, sir. I'm happy to do that. He said, we'll be here at 9.30 in the morning. Don't tell anybody because I like to make these announcements myself. I said, yes, sir. I was just about ready to hang up, and he said, Mikey, would this be shortstop? <laughs> he was a great person. Well, I'd like to conclude by actually just referring back, if we could, to that first discussion we had about the Olympics. All great memories. Of course, after the, we won the bid, there were some hard times and some great times that the day finally came. And one of the wonderful things I got to do was I went to Olympia, Greece to see the lighting of the Olympic flame. Now, this is a picture I took, and I didn't realize that the Olympic flame has such significance in terms of the way it's lighted. These Greek goddesses on the site of the original Olympics came out, and they put flammable material on the bottom of this bowl, and the sun lighted it uh, through heat. And I realized suddenly the Olympic flame is really about the sun and the perpetual burning of the sun. And as soon as that was lighted, there was a moment that I'll never forget, and that's that that goddess raised her hand with the torch that she had. And then from the side, there was a runner dressed in the uniform of the Olympic Games who came out and took the torch and then began to run in a torch run that many of you will remember no matter where you live, for the Olympic flame to be going through your town. And it was astonishing to me how when I walked, watched the Olympic flame, tens of thousands of people would come to, the, to see the Olympic torch. One day I was with the organizer of the torch run and I said to her, I don't think I understand this. Why is it that tens of thousands of people gather to essentially see fire on a stick? She said, Governor, you truly don't get it, do you? She said, let me explain it to you. Let me do it by telling you a story. She said, a couple of weeks ago, we had a break in the runners, and I sent my assistant to find a runner, and she went to a school, and she rushed in and said to the school secretary, I need a runner for the Olympic torch run. Don't give me the student body president. She said, give me somebody who needs a lift. A short time later, we were, she said, I know just the little boy. And a short time later, we were dressing in an Olympic uniform, an undersized fifth grader. This fifth grader then went out to the, went out to the street where literally tens of thousands of people had begun to line the street. He took the flame, struggled a bit with it, but stood strong and tall and ran down the street to the acclaim of tens of thousands of people. With those tens of thousands of people were those children from that school. She said it changed him, it changed us all. Thank you. She said, I got a letter from the school secretary talking about how it had changed them and how it had changed their life and their view. And then she ended by talking about the undersized fifth grader. She said, he doesn't sit alone anymore. She said, Governor, this isn't a fire on a stick. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of the things that we as human beings value the most. It's a symbol of what we aspire to be, courage, our friendships, our aspirations for virtue. 
That's what the Olympic flame is intended to be. So today I leave you with a few family stories, but I leave you with a reminder that we're here not just for a conference. We're here for what truly is the fire on the stick and it's family. And I say to family, God bless you and God bless our families. Thank you.